Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is Monday, August 13th, 2018. You have reached the No Name Cinema Society, and I certainly hope that's what you intended to do. And even if you didn't, we're still glad you're here. You've reached our sound off. It's our freeform segment where we're just going to talk about anything and everything related to movies. Hello, everybody. My name is Jonathan Betzler. I'm here at my home uh, in Los Angeles. I've got my buddy Lou Skywalker here with me, and I've got a couple more co hosts to introduce you to momentarily. Uh, before I do, I want to let you know that this is our Freeform segment again, so it's a little more loose. Like normally, we just re do reviews of specific movies. Here, we it's more of a catch-all. We maybe make references to other episodes, clean up some errors. Um, I do a top five, and we'll get to all that. Um, but first, let me introduce uh, my co-host for the evening, um, the old standby, the founder of the No Name Cinema Society, uh, and here to and with me through 50 episodes now, Drunk Davy. Happening, man. Episode 50.4. Can you believe that? Yeah, man, I believe it. It feels like uh, 50 years. <laughs> he still hasn't lost his enthusiasm for the show, ladies and gentlemen. I hope uh, you can appreciate the fervor with which he does his job. Now, we didn't start out doing the sound off. Sound off didn't come till episode 16. That's why this is our 34th sound off. You do the math, that equals 50. Our other co-host uh, tonight for our 50th uh, episode, the end of our 50th set of episodes, uh, is... Alex Evans, the below the liner. He's here with us with a very strange concoction there, Alex. What do you got there? It is a, a mixture of freshly brewed cold brew coffee concentrate, um, vanilla almond milk, and maple syrup. That sounds extremely gross. I'm going to have a fat tire instead. Um, so See, that sounds really gross to me. Yeah, I know. You don't drink. This is, a, th this is the same beer I had last time, a brand new bottle. I'm very excited to uh, get into this. I, I've needed this after the day I've had. Alex, this is your first sound off. Are you excited? Sure. For what it's worth, now you've done the full, you, like now you you uh, you hit for the cycle. You've done a current feature when you did the post. You did a indie when you did the square. You did a classic when you did Brazil. And now it's your first sound off. You now hit every type of episode that we have. I'm quite the gentleman about town now. I was hoping he'd be a little more enthused than that to, to <laughs> get energy going for our sound off, you know, our big freeform segment. But maybe I'll turn to our schedule to make that happen. We are now obviously ending our 50th set of episodes, but here's what this set of episodes looked like. It started on Thursday, August 2nd, with a review of the new film, Mission Impossible Fallout. Alex was with us a week ago for our review of the indie spotlight, The Square. This past Thursday, we did a classic movie discussion of the 1942 film, The Pride of the Yankees. And of course, now is a sound off where I'm about to introduce a new segment. Alex is going to do a second run, so I'm very excited about that. And I'm going to count down the top five sports biopics based on our discussion of Pride of the Yankees. So that's all coming up on this particular episode. And the very first thing we do in Sound Offs is Davey's least favorite thing that we do in the show, Davey, which is? God, there's so much. Uh... <laughs> do you enjoy the show at all, Davey? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you don't even like movies. I just, have a, high, I just have a high standard for them. Anyway, it's time for this day in history, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. Um, and so on this day, and Alex, of course, is a history buff, so maybe he'll have a thing or two to say about some of these, especially this first one, because on this day, August 13th, in 1932, German President Paul von Hindenburg offers his adversary, Adolf Hitler, the position of vice chancellor in the spirit of keep your enemies close. Hitler wound up refusing, and of course, the rest is a very sad history. And on this day in 1967, Bonnie and Clyde opens in theaters. And of course, that's a classic that we reviewed in episode 46.3, just this past January with me, Davey, and Devin. And on this day in 2016, very recent history, Michael Phelps won his record 23rd and final gold medal in the 4x100 relay in Rio, ending a very prestigious career. And birthdays today, ladies and gentlemen, is of course a guy we reviewed quite a bit, Alfred Hitchcock would have turned 119 today on August 13th. We did a top five Hitchcock films in episode 20.4, and we reviewed Vertigo in episode 14.3, and Suspicion in episode 20. And we've got two more Hitchcock films coming down the pike on our classic movie discussions, so it was worthwhile to mention his birthday. Guys, anybody have anything on any of my tidbits for this day in history? Uh, no, it's been going on for a long time. History has? No, this segment. <laughs> Well, it's one of our shorter segments. Um, well, we'll see what he has to say about our next segment, uh, which um, I'm going to name after uh, a saying from one of our members. This segment is called, What's Their Bucket? 
And that name comes from what society member Jim Carroll says whenever he can't remember someone's name. And the idea here is that we're gonna spotlight character actors. Those actors in movies that you recognize their face but don't always know their name. Throughout history, character actors have populated and enriched a lot of these films, but frequently they don't get the notoriety or are remembered. And so we thought it'd be fun, or at least I thought it'd be fun to take a look at them and we'll see how Davey and Alex react to that. Let me stop you there for a second. I don't know. I don't know that you should be naming this segment after uh, something that Jim says, because I, I see him more as a leading man. You talking about Jim Carroll? Yeah. Why are you buttering up Jim Carroll? He's totally a character actor. <laughs> I don't know. Because you think JB is a character actor? He's just a character. Anyway, so uh, back to back to my new segment. And it's an experiment. If you guys don't like it, we'll we'll eighty six it. Um, our nineteen forty two project was right in the middle of the studio system when actors were under contract to specific distributors. The studios used these role players over and over and over again. You know, we saw some of them in eight or nine films over the course of the nineteen forty two project. They don't get talked about very often, so we thought it'd be nice to have a segment to spotlight them. Uh, and this can happen not only with 1942 actors or, or character actors, but actors of any era that come up on the show. Um, so, so Davey, theoretically, before I start, do you think that this could be an interesting segment as the sound off goes forward in the future? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, if, you know, you talk about the sound off being a resource. For people, I, you know, it's like a, it's a you know a new idea. I like it. I like it. Let's give it a shot. All right. Yeah. I don't know if he actually likes it. Alex, are you excited about this? You're a below the liner kind of person. You would appreciate me paying homage to some people that don't get enough notoriety. Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to start tonight with a character actor uh, that I talked about quite a bit, uh, or at least heavily in my 1942 interview uh, show, and um, we'll see if. Uh, if we remember him, I named him actually the best supporting actor of 1942. See this picture comes up here. It does. This is Cecil Calloway, ladies and gentlemen, an actor who has been in many, many things. And I'll tell you a little bit about him. Cecil Calloway was born in South Africa, actually, in 1890, albeit of British parents. He was a touring actor in his 20s until moving to Australia, where he primarily worked in theater and became a theatrical star there. In 1937, he did an Australian film called It Isn't Done, which caught the eye of RKO, and he soon signed up thereafter. Between Australia and Hollywood, Cecil Calloway's film and TV career spanned 52 years. Just some of the films that he's done and played small roles in include Gunga Din from 1939, in which he played Mr. Stebbins. Wuthering Heights, also from 1939, he played Earnshaw. Mrs. Parkington, where he played the Prince of Wales. The Postman Always Ring Twice, very famously, he played the husband in that film, Lana Turner's husband. He was in Harvey. He played Dr. Chumley in Harvey with Jimmy Stewart. He was Professor Plumcut in Disney's The Shaggy Dog. He worked with John Huston in Cardinal, in which he played Monsignor Monaghan. Not only was he in several of our 1942 films, he was also in one of our 1966 films, the Elvis film Spin Out, which sadly I called the worst film of 1966. He has two Oscar nominations to his credit, his first coming in 1948, in which he played a leprechaun in the film The Luck of the Irish. He lost that Oscar to Walter Houston for Treasure the Sierra Madre. And his most famous role, perhaps, is as the friendly neighborhood priest who gives advice to Spencer Tracy in the 1967 film Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, co-starring Catherine Hepburn, of course. He would lose that Oscar to George Kennedy for Cool Hand Luke. Cecil Calloway was in seven films from our year of 1942. Uh, the one I named him Best Supporting Actor for was uh, the film that you see behind me here. It's called I Married a Witch, in which he played the witch's father. Now, that movie, of course, inspired the TV show Bewitched, in which it switched the witch's parent to a mother famously played by Agnes Moorhead, who Davey might remember from Johnny Belinda. Do you remember Agnes Moorhead? Which one was she? She was the sister that lived with Jane Wyman. Sister. She would go on to play the mother in Bewitched. She's also in Citizen Kane, for what it's worth. When Bewitched did a special Christmas episode... In a wink and a nod to its predecessor, guess who they got to play Santa Claus? Cecil Calloway? They got two-time Oscar nominee Cecil Calloway to play Santa Claus, which I thought was a fun link between Bewitched and I Married a Witch. Guys, that's Cecil Calloway in a nutshell, a guy that has been in many, many films that doesn't get talked about enough. I feel like he should have won an Oscar in 1942, but he's been in so many films over the years, I thought it was worthwhile to spotlight his career. Davey, anything on Cecil Calloway? I think you pretty much covered it, man. Have you seen any of those films that I talked about? Johnny Belinda. He's not in that. Agnes Moorhead's in that. 
I don't think I'd seen any of the other ones. Guess who's coming to dinner? It's possibly that's probably his most famous one. I'm familiar with it. I don't know that I've seen the whole thing. Are you more into the Ashton Kutcher remake with Bernie Mac? It's called Guess Who? Question mark. Yeah, and it also has Zoe Saldana. Is it as good as it sounds? Better. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, anything on Cecil Calloway or the segment in general? I guess he's coming to dinner it was a good movie, and I liked Harvey, so seems like a cool guy. You remember Cecil Calloway in any of these films? Not enough to speak with any authority. But now in the future, you guys can like, oh my God, that's Cecil Calloway, and it'll all sort of come back to this moment where we spotlighted his career. Yes. Yeah, you know it. I got my list made up. You're going to do a Cecil Calloway marathon now? <laughs> yeah. I'm canceling this weekend. <laughs> That's all his dates from now on, is just having the ladies watch Cecil <laughs> Calloway pictures with him. His Actually, performances are the ultimate aphrodisiac. <laughs> <laughs> Davey needs all the help he can get, believe me. Um, <laughs> I'd argue, but... <laughs> <laughs> Davey, the one I would recommend, of course, is I Married a Witch. It's a terrific performance. Davey, what do you think about this new segment overall? It's got promise. What would you like to improve? I don't know, maybe uh, something from the last few decades. But no, no, it's fine. That was good. I enjoyed it. We can mix in something from the last few decades. I can make that happen. The 40s are good, too. Don't just abandon them. Believe you me. (laughs) I won't abandon the 40s. It's time for a second run. The second run is when a film comes up in conversation in the show that one of us hasn't seen, and then they go out and watch it, and they come back on a sound off, and we re-review it now that this other person has seen it, or rediscuss it. Uh, in episode 48.3, we did a review of the film Brazil. And in our brackets, Brazil defeated this film in the sci-fi brackets. Neither Davey nor Alex had seen this film, but now at least one of them has seen it, and we're talking about Richard Fleischer's The Fantastic Voyage or Just Fantastic Voyage, is the poster behind me. And it's from one of our studied years, 1966. So it's one of our 1966 films, which I watched back for the 1966 project, and then it came up in the brackets, and neither of them, neither Alex, uh, Alex did the show with us on Brazil. He hadn't seen it, and Davey, of course, had not seen it, because he only watched five films from 1966. And so, so now, at least Alex has gone out and watched the Fantastic Voyage. Isn't that right, Alex? earlier today big question is davy did you also watch fantastic voyage you know i did he did we got a double second run here and the first time davy's ever participated usually the second run is all me so this is very exciting it, the last time someone else did it is when jim watched the russians are coming the russians are coming another 1966 film for the first time and we had a good discussion with then without davy participating and now alex has seen fantastic voyage and davy has so this is going to be fun. We're going to get to open a can of worms on this film because uh, we didn't get to talk about it too much in the Brazil episode. Um, before we get to talk about it, guys, I'm going to do a quick summary. Does that work? Sure. Fantastic Voyage. An important scientist has a severe brain injury, and the government has the very unique idea to shrink people and a vessel to microscopic size to journey inside the human body to repair the damage and save the doctor. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Fantastic Voyage. Alex, how was that summary? I think it was pretty good. Dave, you okay with the summary? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. So we finally get to see how these guys feel about the Fantastic Voyage. I know those of you that watched episode 48.3 were very disappointed you didn't get to hear it. So this is a big moment for all of you. Alex, first time Fantastic Voyage. What'd you think? I thought the production design within the body was pretty cool and well done very imaginative and clearly deeply researched i thought the script and acting was wanting and so was the editing okay script and acting wanting davy honestly i just thoroughly loved this a really good time i'm so happy i mentioned in the 48.3 episode when we talked about brazil that i was so looking forward to seeing it and was disappointed by how clunky it felt and how over the top it was and how bad Donald Pleasance was. But <laughs> because I watched it as a kid and I loved it as a kid, so but rewatching it, it definitely felt awkward, I guess is a good way to put it for me. But Davey, you loved it. Tell me more. It's something you can't do anymore. Actors hamming it up. Every line is read in this serious sci-fi 60s. Trekkie in kind of banter kind of thing? Yeah, it is. And it, but it's also, it's not something you could do anymore. It would just come off as camp. Well, it does come off as camp, though. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. There's a sincerity to it. There's an earnestness. It just works. Were you dreading watching it? 
No, not that one. I think I've been holding off on it because I always meant to read the book, the Isaac Asimov book. You know, the book is a novelization of the movie. It's always something that's intrigued me. And I loved Inner Space, which I saw in the theater as a kid. My little tidbit is Isaac Asimov would then write a sequel that really has little to nothing to do with the original. But he would write a sequel, uh, I think it was like a graphic novel almost, that took place in Russia. Um, it was never made into a movie, but... Uh, Isaac Asimov took the idea after the novelization and went off with it in in different direction. Alex, do you have a rebuttal to Davey? You know, just taking it for what it is, it was fun. And you watched it with your roommate too, right? Dan watched about half of it. Did he have anything to say that you'd like to add into this mix? He had fun. Did he come in for the second half or did he tap out? He walked into the room during the second half. Okay. Well, you he... should have started it over, man. You should have... <laughs> the second half is the stronger half. Um, Alex, I do want to dig in. What did you mean by the editing? What did you not like about the editing? So there's all these moments where, like, in a modern film, you'd be like, okay, we have a shot of the guy walking in the front door. Then he just, like, walks into the room where, like, the dramatic scene happens, where they're like, okay, he's on this little, like, go-kart with the military official. He's going to go up like six flights of stairs with it through like a bunch of rooms with like no sound design and no music. And you're just like, this is just five minutes on this like little blue cart. We're going to show every step of them walking up three flights of stairs. Why? <laughs> <laughs> it affects pace, right? It's, it's supposed to be like an action movie. It just like slows down for like, oh, okay. He's got to walk into the other room now. It's the pace of those old sci-fi movies. They're just kind of like thinkers. They're slow <laughs> and they well, plod. And then there's some loud noise later on and people reacting to it. And like, it seemed intentional. Like, the audience needs to know how big this office is. Yeah. It, it just... <laughs> Which we don't. It's fine. We can take it for granted that the government has a large office space. This guy ha is the only one who knows the secret of miniaturization. We need to use miniaturization to save him. You're like, well, don't you already have it then? The doctor that's sick is the only one that knows the secret? I thought yeah, he That's what they say at the beginning. Because he could go, he could keep them small for longer than an hour, dude. Oh, oh so he- Were you he, not paying he, attention? That does make sense. I'll give him some credit. Now, Davey, Donald Pleasant, who has so come up a great. couple times. So great. Do you remember him from Will Penny? I do. I also remember him from Halloween. Will Penny is a show we reviewed, but yes. We'll get to Halloween. We do all the classics. He has that panic attack. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> My hands! <laughs> that was amazing! <laughs> it was a bad acting of a person acting like they were having a panic attack. So, I don't know. I think it was pretty so spot on. So, by the property, that makes it good? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> well, because... Yeah. The character himself wasn't really having a panic attack, and that did not look like a panic attack to me, so it was perfect. And he was playing a guy who's a spy who's a bad actor. <laughs> There's layers to this performance. Next level thinking here in the No Name Cinema Society, ladies and gentlemen. I think we need to cover the color palette in this film. Oh, the color palette! Bring it on, Davey! It was amazing! When they would use blue screen versus rear projection, they would have blue backgrounds outside the windows to mask it a bit more. <laughs> Very imaginative. You know it's a good show when we start getting snarky on about <laughs> the movie itself. I will acknowledge the premise is so great. Like, I love the premise of this movie. I want so badly it, for it to be stronger. Guillermo del Toro is developing a remake right now. That seems right up his alley. Feels like it could use, like, a real strong remake. Everything about the premise feels like it could be really functional. Yeah, and it, it's been spoofed in so many franchises. I don't know, man. I had fun with it. I'm in for a remake, but I don't think it, it needs to be remade. I mean, I think they nailed it. And Raquel Welch didn't look hot enough. Like, she looks hot, but just not hot enough for to, to make it yeah, Raquel Yeah, the Magic Welch School Bus episode that took this concept was also excellent. Davey, would this sneak into your top five 1966 film? Now you've watched seven 1966 films. This is where does <laughs> rank in the seven? Oh, yeah. It's up there. Um, I don't know. I'm thinking <laughs> it's it Number one, maybe. is it a Ahead it of may, Who's Afraid of Virginia it Wolf? May have, it may have just gone right past Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf. I think AFI really needs to reevaluate. In all seriousness, though. I mean, I think I like it better than Alfie. And the fortune cookie? Ooh, I don't know. Uh, they're so different. I pr I might have enjoyed it more than the fortune cookie. Um, I don't say, I'm not going to say I enjoyed it more than uh, Man for All Seasons or uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf, because those are, those are big time. It didn't win versus Brazil in the sci-fi bracket. Would anyone like to suggest that it should have now that you've watched it? Yes. <laughs> it's a big statement. 
Yeah, now you then you chuckle. Are you being serious? Or you just I pull it off? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm I'm making sure. Serious. Alex, can you say it's better than Brazil? Oh, it's a tough call. I feel like the premise and just plot structure of Fantastic Voyage is more solid than the bones of Brazil. Holy cow. Like the wow. foundation of it is better. I think the technical execution of Brazil is better, but you know, it's it's on shaky ground. I don't think anything in Brazil looks as awesome as, as some of those scenes in inside the body. Um, I I like it. I, oh, I, when he's tumbling around inside the lung, I was hooked. It was great. Yeah, when they were uh, like pulling the the weeds or whatever out of the you know, vents. I really liked all just the tar bits in the lung. <laughs> You're like, okay, this guy's definitely a smoker. <laughs> <laughs> So it's an anatomy lesson as well with some health warnings. I was approached by somebody that watched our show in Brazil that said Brazil was their favorite film of all time. That surprised me. I was like, oh, wow. Has that person seen Fantastic Voyage? I don't know. I'll have to ask them. They were at a CMS recently. Oh, Next time I see that person. Most people will refute my favorite film, so that's, that's fair. Is it The Seventh Seal? No. Well, I would say The Seventh Seal is my favorite film, but it is not my favorite movie. Okay, making the distinction. Do you want to share it or do you want us to keep it? Sure. This? It's a cable guy from 1996. I don't dislike The Cable Guy. I just enjoy it more than any other movie I've ever seen. <laughs> I don't have like a technical argument for it or anything. It's just I just like it. You entertain Davey. Uh, Davey is chatting with me during this whole conversation. Are you guys good to wrap up Fantastic Voyage? He said one thing in the chat. It's not the whole conversation. No, I understand, but I'm, I'm using it to segue. Are you guys good with the, are you guys good with the Fantastic Voyage? Can I move on? If, if we must. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, if you've got more to say about the Fantastic Voyage, by all means, now is the time. I, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Davey, anything else on Fantastic Voyage? No, I'm, I'm good. I just I just love it, and everyone should go watch it, like, now. They should stop watching this. Time out. Watch this. <laughs> if you stop watching this, you're going to subscribe first, and then you yeah. can stop watching it. No, they're not. They're, our fans are awful fans. The ones that aren't watching the show right now. It's a, he's impo Don't worry about him, folks. It's impossible to keep him happy. I'm going to try right now, though, because he uh, he mentioned that he's watched another film that's come up on the show. He uh, We reviewed a show without him not too long ago in ep our episode 49.1, and he wasn't able to make it. Devin substituted for him in the last minute, um, and the film was oh. Ant-Man and the Wasp, which was a noteworthy episode for us. Davey, do you know why it was a noteworthy episode for us? Did you watch the episode? Yeah, I did. What I missed. Well, it was the episode where we featured our first female panelist. Well, that is big. The new morning in America. You didn't notice that at all? Davey doesn't see gender. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the impression from the chat that Davey would like me to segue to him. He has thoughts on Ant Man and the Wasp. What did you think of this show and what did you think of the movie? You did a great job. Everyone did a great job. But the one thing that you guys got just wrong. I knew there was something. I knew I was walking into a trap when he's like, Ant Man and the Wasp in the chat. You kept downplaying um, the magnitude of, you know, the why they broke up, why Ant Man and the Wasp had broken up in the past. Uh, he broke the law. He went against the Registration Act. He sided with Captain America. It's broke awful. The other. Side with Captain America. Who does that? That is the worst. Captain America was the bad guy, the lawbreaker. Isn't that open to interpretation of Captain America as the bad guy? To the general public, the law-abiding people who, you know, maybe didn't have the whole story. But I don't think that applies to Hank Pym and his daughter. That's not a decision you make on your own. You don't just not mention it to your significant other. All three of us felt like it wasn't that big a thing. And you all three of you are wrong. Civil War. It's like if you ran off to the South to fight during the Civil War and didn't mention it to your girlfriend. It's the same thing. It's not the same thing at all. Alex, have you seen Ant-Man and the Wasp? I have not. Let's do our top five next here. The top five tonight is my top five sports biopics. Right up my alley, and it's based on our discussion of Pride of the Yankees, which was our last classic. Now, here are the rules. In order to be a biopic, it must be a movie about a real-life sports figure. So no Rocky on this list, no Karate Kid. Rudy would qualify on this list, um, but I think Rudy is highly overrated, um, yeah. so I'm not going to include that movie. Sorry, Talia. Like, uh, there are people that uh, think Rudy is good. Talia on the show is a big fan of the film Rudy. I uh, <laughs> I don't like it. I can't wait till they do battle on the next sound it's, off. It's That's one thing to like Brazil, but to love Rudy? Come on. <laughs> <laughs>
So there's going to be no Rudy on this list. Um, now, I struggle with number five on this list uh, the most. I went back and forth with it because I was thinking, how could I realistically exclude Raging Bull from this list? I acknowledge that it's an extremely accomplished, well-made film with masterful performances, but its dark, misanthropic nature and bleak perspective prevent me from loving it. And I'd much rather watch any of these other five films. So as it turns out, I do wind up, unfortunately, leaving Raging Bull off the list of my top five sports biopics. All right, so number five is going to be familiar to you guys. Let's see if it goes straight to that movie. It does! Number five, I am going to bring Pride of the Yankees up here for number five. And it's a movie that we hashed over extensively in the last episode. As I said, it's an extremely flawed film, but it's emotionally powerful. It's less of a sports movie and more of a love story. It's this emphasis on character that's what makes the film last, as long as it has, 76 years now. Even though there's very little baseball in it, it sets the blueprint for a lot of the sports biopics that would come after it. For more from me and Davey, check out episode 50.3, the episode before this, and Davey opined on it plenty on that episode. Alex, I don't suppose you've seen Pride of the Yankees. I probably you... saw it when I was like 12. That was like two weeks ago, wasn't it? It's very kind well, of. not emotionally 12. <laughs> it's not even there yet. Um... <laughs> Another year or two. All right, number four. Uh, number four is kind of an interesting case. Uh, because number four is something of a, it started out as a TV movie, actually, uh, back when TV movies were a major event. Um, this one was so iconic that it was actually remade into another TV TV movie. It's called, ladies and gentlemen, let's see if this works. There it is. Brian's Song is, oh. is uh, my number four. Brian's Song is about the real life friendship between Chicago Bears MVP Gale Sayers and his white teammate, Brian Piccolo. And I specify white because the racial relationship was really important when the film came out in 1971. It starred James Caan and Billy D. Williams, and I've got a copy of it right here. Um, and having them as uh, cast members is a huge advantage right out of the gate. They're both super charming and have great chemistry between the two of them. The screenplay is very effective some terrific character-driven scenes that advance the plot and their relationship, especially impressive given that it's technically a TV movie. The direction itself is a little hackneyed. That's what makes it feel like a TV movie, if anything, but it marries very little because by the time the film reaches its heartbreaking conclusion, you're pretty hooked. This is a movie I've always loved. I even have Brian Piccolo's jersey from the movie, which I didn't wear because I didn't want to give it away, but I own that Chicago Bears jersey, which I think is kind of fun. Davey, you had an audible response. Do you have a thoughts on Brian's song? The heaviness of Raging Bull kept that off the list. This is not a walk in the park, this thing. I mean, I said the dark misogyny of Raging Bull. I mean, what yeah, Brian's song... Definitely the misogyny, I'll give you. That's There's no misogyny in Brian's song. <laughs> right. And I also said the misanthropic nature of Raging Bull. Um, this doesn't have any of that. This has hope. They were the first interracial roommates ever in the NFL. It's a great movie. As a kid, I loved it too. It's kind of like human old yeller. Feels like it's minimizing it, but it's not. I, I get what you're saying. <laughs> old you yeller know, you is a classic. Like, it's going to stab you in the heart at the end. If you've got a pulse, you're gonna yeah. you're gonna move by this movie. So it, it felt important to include it on this list. Alex, have you seen Brian's song? I have not. Do you want to borrow it? Because I've got it right here. Second run. Sure. <laughs> That's gonna be a really good episode. Could be, it could be. It's a special movie. I'm glad you like it. Uh, I'm glad you like it, Davey. Um, now the next movie on our list is actually relates to Alex in the sense it's it's one of our 1988 movies. Is my number three film. Um, and here it is now. Let's see if I can uh, change the picture behind me. I don't know if you can see it, but it's Eight Men Out, directed by John Sayles. It's the story of the Black Sox of 1919 who threw the World Series. Long seen as a black mark on the history of baseball, indie director John Sayles investigates it a little more thoroughly and expertly gets underneath the character's needs and motivations. We find out that the story of the Black Sox of 1919 is not as black and white as we thought. It's amazing that the level of detail in a period piece that Sayles and his team achieves on such a small budget. It's also got an outstanding ensemble, including John Cusack, D.B. Sweeney, and Sales' favorite actor, David Strathairn. This is a movie not just for baseball lovers. It's a movie for film lovers. It's a terrific film. Alex, have you seen Amen Out? You're going to have to later this year. No, but it sounds like exactly the kind of movie I'd enjoy. Cool. Davey? No, it's a fantastic film. It's a fantastic film. All right. I'm on a roll here with Davey. Um, 
so my number two is a movie that last time we checked, Davey had not seen. Because I mentioned it in, pr previously on another top five in episode 11.1 .1 when I did a top five live action Disney films. Um, and it's one of the best stories, best sports stories of the 20th century. Ladies and gentlemen, Miracle is my number two sports biopic. And I was surprised at the time that Davey had not seen it. It's of course the story of the 1980 US Olympic hockey team. Miracle avoids the traps and tropes that come with being a Disney movie, never feeling cheesy or over the top while still maintaining its sense of awe and excitement. It features, for lack of a better word, a miraculous performance from Kurt Russell as coach Herb Brooks, whose locker room speech is played in stadia nationwide to pump up the crowds. So this movie has had an impact Miracle features characters that feel real, and as a result, it's every bit as inspiring as all the fictional sports films that we love, like Rocky, The Karate Kid, and The Natural. It's a moving, exciting movie, and even though we know the result, terrific achievement by director Gavin O'Connor. Ladies and gentlemen, Miracle's my number two. Alex, have you seen Miracle? I have, and I really like it. Okay, all right, this is the first film Alex has seen on the list, so that's kind of exciting. Um, and, and I got a thumbs up from him. Uh, and now, when I, we did episode 11.1 .1 in May of 2015, Davey has, had not seen Miracle. Have you since seen Miracle, Davey? I have not. I need to see it. it I, that's, that's one I want to see. <laughs> you see, even when he says that, it, it, it twists. It's suggesting that everything else I say are things that he doesn't want to see. Like, I don't know if you guys in the audience have noticed the subtext there, but he says There's no like, subtext. Oh, it's... okay, there you go. There was plain as day text. Do you have more to say on Miracle, aside from you like it? Do you agree with my basic analysis of it? Yeah, I thought it was well shot, well directed, well acted, enjoyed it. Surprising how good Kurt Russell is, right? I like Kurt Russell. I did not expect that kind of performance from him. Did you see Overboard? Yeah, did you see Escape from New York? Did you see Escape from L.A.? Tango so and Cash? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I still say Miracles is best work. Um, now, my number one is potentially the most controversial. Um, it's a highly underrated film from a master filmmaker. And no other sports biopic that I know of gets as deeply behind a character than this film, which fo focuses itself on a very particular time in the life and career of one of the most memorable athletes of our time, Ali. Michael Mann is an expert storyteller, but here the focus is on character, which are the movies that move me the most. With strangely evocative handheld cinematography from Emmanuel Lubezki, who we know as Chivo, and a surprising Oscar-nominated tour de force performance from Will Smith, this film is not your standard biopic. While it covers all the story beats, it gives us insight into the focus, resolve, anger, and frustration that Cassius Clay experiences as he goes on a very emotional and religious journey during a hugely pivotal time in his life that leads him to become Muhammad Ali. The recent director's cut that came out even enhances this, adding more scenes that dig deeper into this enigmatic figure. It's a film that's told with great detail, precision, and passion. The film Ali is a somewhat neglected masterpiece that is simultaneously cerebral and emotional. I almost say it's a near-perfect movie. I imagine this is a film that at least Davey has seen. It's shameful, but I haven't seen it. Alex, Ali. I have not seen it. It's a Michael Mann film, guys. I know. He lost me with Public Enemies. This was before Public Enemies. I liked Heat. <laughs> okay, he lost, he lost you somewhere in between. Because this is his film right after The Insider. It was The Insider and then this, I believe. I didn't see The Insider either. Insider is one of my, that's a top 100 film for me, The Insider. Anyway, I love Ali. Um, it'll be interesting to see if Davey ever winds up watching it. It sounds like you saw most of my top five, Davey, or at least two, two of the five, maybe. Um, any comments about the top five in general, gentlemen? It was all right. The ones I didn't see, I, I want to see. Um, so that, that's something. You want to talk about the exclusions? Like films? Yeah, that I mean, it's hard to leave the natural off, isn't it? Natural's <laughs> not a true story. I see what you're saying. It's got to be a true story. I get it. Well, it's a sports biopic, right? Biopic, yeah. Natural's yeah. All time, is top 25 all time for me, but it's, the, 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 what you gave me was real life, was a sports biopic, therefore a real life figure. I mean, the other one that I left off was Newt Rockne, All-American, which maybe is too old for you guys, but that's the famous win one for the Gipper movie with Ronald Reagan. With the hurricane. That was pretty good. Was the hurricane better than any of the films uh, I mentioned? Remember, remember the Titans was a good one. Ooh, remember the Titans was a good one, wasn't it? Was it? Was it this yeah, good? Yeah, they play though? against my high school, Herndon Hornets. But, okay, but it was better than Miracle and, uh, and uh, Eight Men Out and... 
what was the other one that was seen by you guys? Uh, Brian's Song is better than those films? I haven't seen Brian's Song, but I feel like it might be. I mean, all, there are other films out there. I mean, Sea Biscuit is another one that I thought oh. was okay. Yeah, there you go. Sea Biscuit gets better that you think than Eight Men Out and Brian's Song? I don't know. I liked 42 and Coach Carter. 42 was okay. It wasn't great. Harrison Ford it was, was okay. Great. I mean, right now you're just naming movies. You're not necessarily naming no, I'm <laughs> better. See, I'm looking through lists and seeing which movies I liked. Okay. I'm not naming okay. every movie. <laughs> <laughs> if you start throwing in Coach Carter, then you it sounds like you're naming every movie. But the Blind yeah. Side. You didn't even talk about The Blind Side. I wouldn't call that a biopic. It's a different genre. No, I would call a Blind Side a biopic. I definitely would. The Blind Side was on a short list. I made a list of about 10, and then I narrowed it down to five. Blind Side was on that first short list, for sure. Like, probably seven or eight. But I have The Blind Side, understandably, behind Raging Bull. I haven't seen The Blind Side. I'm just saying that I, I hear good things about it. Nobody commented on the Raging Bull situation. I, I probably couldn't justify keeping it off, but I, you know what? I get it, because I remember Saturday Night Fever. I hate that movie. It's for basically the same reasons. It's just unwatchable. What? What about Cool Runnings? I don't like Cool Runnings. <laughs> that's that's your loss. Is, is it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a great movie, but I don't know that it's top five. Guys, I'm going to wrap things up, uh, I think. Um, so, and we're ending our first 50 set of episodes tonight. This is the end. We're going to have, we're going to move on now to our second set of 50 episodes, starting with episode 51.1 coming up in a few weeks. Uh, Davey, like, 50 down the tubes. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, let's, here's to, uh, you know, put another 50 down the tubes. Down the tubes. <laughs> Alex, you've joined us for at least four or five of our 50. Are you excited? Ecstatic. Filled with jubilance. Jubilance. And this is your first sound off. So, any comments on that? It's all right. I feel like I would have tried to watch Ant Man and the Wasp, but I'd known that was on the table. I didn't know it was on the table either. It literally came up during well, the second run. Second run. That's right. You go watch it. We'll 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 talk. We'll find a way to talk about it. I'm sure I'll see it at some point. Ant Man of the Wasp was literally a audible. It was you know I was not planning on it. Davies mentioned in the chat. I'm like I think that's a hint. He wants he wants to talk about it. I took the hint, and I regret it. Believe you me. Um, <laughs> We'll be back. We'll be back on Thursday, August 23rd for our next current feature. We're going to talk about Albert Hughes' next film, Alpha. Supposedly, we're going to have Nate back for that. That'll kick off our 51st set of episodes. In the meantime, uh, Alex and Davey say goodbye to our audience. Goodbye, audience goodbye. that's not watching and doesn't subscribe. Maybe you guys should subscribe. There's a button somewhere on here to subscribe. Just click it right now. No problem. And there's a bell. If you hit that bell, the bell will remind you whenever we post it. If you just shout subscribe as loud as you can, your computer <laughs> will automatically do it. <laughs> if you don't true. get a message, don't just shout him. louder. Don't listen to him. That's not true. And I, before any more trouble gets caused, I'm going to close it out. Ladies and gentlemen, this meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is adjourned.